Welcome to our final and closing session for this conference. My name is Stacy Nixon, and I'm a member of the National Board. I did Fulbright, uh, Fulbrights in South Africa and Ghana, just as a brief introduction. We're excited to have everyone here to discuss social justice, prejudice, health, and education. And I know that by the topic, we know the areas of intersectionality and how all of those things can relate to one another. We're very fortunate to have a panel with us, a local panel, that comes with myriad experience in many topics that cover those areas. We've got folks who have specialties in affordable housing, immigrants' rights, inclusive practice around race and gender, environmental health, sustainability, Indian child welfare. Those are just a few of the topics that this group can touch upon. Of course, their knowledge and experience is broader than that, and so that's where you come in. You'll have the opportunity not only to listen and learn, but to tap into their minds and their experiences and uh, be able to ask questions. From our left, and speaking in this order, will be Senator Julie Gonzalez, Dr. Kristen Deal, Lucille Echohawk, and Tom Gonzalez and I will provide a brief bio for each before they speak. Our first speaker is Senator Julie Gonzalez. She's the Colorado Senate Majority Whip. She is a self-described progressive Democrat, represents the urban areas of Denver, although I would imagine most of Denver would be urban. Uh, her district is District 34. She is a lifelong organizer of working people, youth, and Latinos. She focuses on issues of affordable housing, educational justice, and immigrant rights. She serves as the chair of the Judiciary Committee and the Committee on Legal Services, and in her spare time, she's the co-chair of the Colorado Democratic Latino Caucus. Let us welcome Senator Gonzalez. Thank you all so much uh, for that warm introduction and for all of the, the people who have come to Colorado and to Denver uh, to spend time uh, and to participate in this fantastic convening. Um, my name is Julie Gonzalez, and I'm honored to represent Northwest and Downtown Denver in the Colorado State Senate. It is hard for me to speak to you all without first telling you a little bit about who I am, my family. My mother um, goes back generations um, uh, in Southern Colorado. My dad uh, goes back generations in Northern New Mexico. We're that old school Chicanos who have been here since before it was Mexico, right? And um, when my mom was pregnant with me, my dad got a job managing uh, five different ranches for the San Carlos Apache tribe. And so my mom uh, and my dad moved out, made in Colorado, born in Arizona. And um, I grew up on the reservation in, in um, San Carlos, Arizona until I was 10 years old. My dad got a different job managing a different ranch, this time on the border of South Texas. Um, we moved there in 1993, and uh, in the summer of 1993, in January 1st, 1994, um, for the history geeks uh, in the room, like me, also a history major, the passage of NAFTA um, also fundamentally started to change those borderlands. Both the res and the border were incredibly political spaces that five-year-old, 10-year-old, 15-year-old Julie didn't necessarily have the vocabulary to understand, but were incredibly political spaces that then demonstrated in very real ways access and opportunity or lack thereof 
Five-year-old Julie remembers going to the um, grocery store at the res and seeing iceberg lettuce and that was it. And then going to the grocery store, the first one off of the res, and seeing romaine, spinach, all of these other types of lettuce that I don't even, I didn't have vocabulary to describe. The same thing happens within our political systems. The capital in the state of Colorado, um, when Colorado first became a state, um, we wrote our constitution in English, in Spanish, and in German because that history, that diversity, both was our history, was our legacy, and yet it is our strength. But at a certain point, when so many legislators from Southern Colorado who spoke Spanish, when, when the state of Colorado recognized that the tax remittances from Southern Colorado were lower than what it cost to actually translate our statutes, translate um, our bills into Spanish, there was an open question and open debate as to whether or not Southern Colorado should even continue to be a part of the state of Colorado, whether, whether we should just give, it, give the valley back to New Mexico. There were open conversations that took place about that. As we gear up in 2026 for our uh, sesquicentennial, 150 year anniversary, right? How do communities of color engage? How do folks who have been at the margins, how do folks whose voices haven't always been taken into effect, uh, into account, start to make effect about the laws and policies that impact them? I like to tell young people in my life, y'all might not care about politics, but politics cares about you. And what we see in this moment has been multiple crises. Mo crises on after crises after crises. And what I will share is that if we know that crisis exacerbates inequality, if in the aftermath of the COVID-19 pandemic, if in the aftermath of incredible social stratification, if in the aftermath and in the midst of climate collapse, who are we but to step up and offer our perspectives and do the work that we can in order to help make a better Colorado and a stronger world. It's the values that my family instilled in me. It's the, it's the values that this state um, was founded upon. And as we navigate incredible social tension and strife, it is the work for us to continue forward in doing. Thank you all so much for this opportunity. Thank you very much, Senator. Our next speaker is Dr. Kristen Deal, who is the Assistant Vice Chancellor for Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion at the University of Denver. Dr. Deal's scholastic work focuses on the intersections of race, gender, emotionality, and inclusive practices. At the university, she works towards providing spaces of understanding, implementing, and evaluating effective DEI programming. She holds a doctorate in higher education from Denver University. Welcome. I, uh, the academic in me means I have to prepare my remarks. It's fantastic to be here with you all today and uh, to share the stage with amazing thinkers and practitioners. Um, I work at the University of Denver. I've been there for 14 years now. Um, and every so often I get the chance to teach a course. Uh, and as an instructor, I share with my students, most of whom are kind of master's doctoral students, um, my underlying assumptions, right? Just gonna be transparent with y'all um, that I bring to my work. They include uh, identity matters. Context matters, emotions matter, reality and perception are interconnected. We are joining a conversation already and always in progress. There is no one size fits all solution to social justice work. Rather, there is a multitude of possibility and there is always room to grow. 
So these are some of the tenets I return to each morning as I go to campus, and I'm going to use a couple of them to ground my thinking here with you. So first, context matters. By a show of hands, just wondering how many of you folks would consider yourself a Colorado local? Ah, we got a couple. I myself am a transplant, um, originally from Southern California. The University of Denver, where I work, has been part of the Colorado landscape since before it was a state. In March of 1864, DU was founded by the then territorial governor, John Evans. He was also the founder of Northwestern University just outside of Chicago. At that time, he was what we called the superintendent of Indian affairs, and he was named so by President Lincoln. Eight months after DU's founding on November 29, 1864, the Sand Creek Massacre took place about 180 miles east of here in present-day Eads, Colorado. John Evans, in his role as governor, made possible the legal and political environment of the massacre. And Colonel John Shivington, who led the Colorado militia to the plains of Colorado that, that early morning, almost 159 years ago, was, the, was on the original board of overseers for the university. Approximately 200 Cheyenne and Arapaho women, children, and elderly were murdered that morning under the white flag that they had been promised would protect them. Most of the men were out of camp hunting, trying to provide their people sustenance after having been regularly removed from their lands to the margins of Colorado in the bend of the Sandy Creek. About twice a month, I, uh, I get the opportunity to share with new employees at DU um, in orientation, and I always start with a story. This is the context in which DU was founded, and it is not all that dissimilar from Colorado and the Rocky Mountain West in general. This is the context, in, context into which new employers are joining us. It is our history, and now it is their history. And I ask each of them to join in thinking about what it means to be at an institution of higher education in this country that can attend to the complexity of such a beginning what it might mean for us today here actually in this conference room to consider that the land underneath our feet has been the homelands to at least 60 tribes, most of which were removed by force and through brutal means. I have the opportunity, uh, or to have the opportunity to think collectively about this topic, racial justice, prejudice, health and education, uh, but understanding that our opportunity today is provided through the continuing ripple effects of settler colonialism. Second, we're joining a conversation already in progress. In 2013, Colorado Public Radio, alongside I9, or iNews, released a report titled Losing Ground, exploring the reality of racial equity in Colorado since 1953 thinking about where black and Latin A communities stand in relation to the economic gains of whites, Colorado once led the nation in closing equity gaps, but now, in many cases, our black and brown communities are worse off than they were 60 years ago in Colorado. Black Coloradans earn about 60 cents to the dollar compared to whites, and our Latin A community fare worse, earning about 50 cents to the dollar. This is just one statistic of many that show how the communities have lost ground. They have lower graduation rates and lower rates of home ownership compared to whites, to name a few of the widening gaps here in Colorado. Though we have seen some improvements since 2013, in the last 10 years, economic, educational, health, and employment precarity has been a mainstay for our communities of color in Colorado. Third, last year, but not least, there is no one-size-fits-all solution to social justice work. Rather, there is always a multitude of possibilities. DU's motto is a great public institution dedicated to the public good. In my 13 plus years at DU, I have seen both improvements and disappointments in our work in DEI. We are often on the knife's edge, understanding the national landscape of DEI and the tensions of deep racism and racial relations in Colorado, alongside the great work being done in a variety of spaces at the university in creating and providing sustaining supports for our communities of color. I'll name a couple. First, our Faculty Institute for Inclusive Teaching provides faculty supports for the shifting classroom practices toward creating inclusive spaces for all of our students. 
Next, uh, student inclusion and belonging centers provide students with support and capacity building at both the identity specific level and at the intersectional levels towards success, including our students of color, our LGBTQ students, our first gen students, and a social justice education program that will support all students in creating an ecosystem that is affirming and welcoming for all. Last, we have curricular justice initiatives, uh, mini engagements through federal grants. Um, we have an NEH grant, an NSF grant, and an NIH grant, all actually in the division that I help run. These are a few of the things that we're doing in terms of research to create sustaining practices in DEI, and we do have to hold them in tension, understanding national context and the things that are driving the larger political environment. I'm excited to, to join this panel and share more as we go. Thank you. Thank you again, Dr. Deal. Next, we have Lucille Echohawk. Ms. Echohawk is a citizen of the Pawnee Nation of Oklahoma and resides in Arveda, Colorado. She's worked in Indian child welfare nonprofit and philanthropic fields for 30 years. She's been a strategic advisor with the Casey Family Programs. She served as executive director of the Denver Indian Family Resource Center. She holds a BA from Brigham Young University and a master's degree from Loyola of Chicago. We welcome Lucille Echohawk. Good afternoon. Uh, I'm very honored to be among you today and look forward to uh, a very interesting discussion both with our uh, panel and with you all as well. Um, I am the second of six children uh, born to Ernest and Jane Echo Hawk, who neither of whom had uh, a higher education, but their vision was that their six children would have that opportunity. And with a lot of hard work, because my parents didn't have a lot, and, uh, but they would support us however they could, but we had to support ourselves in the acquisition of education. And as my brother Larry, who went on to become uh, the attorney, state attorney general in uh, Idaho often said, uh, what made us as a family what we are today is the power of education. And I have spent much of my life trying to be a good role model to certainly those in my family and my tribe, but also uh, to many other native young people in, in this country uh, that is Native America. And uh, we haven't been treated very well in our own land through the years, but, uh, uh, and many people talk about our tragic history, and certainly it is that, but we are not only survivors, we are looking to be thrivers. And uh, that's how I have dedicated my professional life as have my uh, siblings. Uh, we tout three lawyers in my family, all of whom have been engaged in promoting and working hard to ensure that Native people in this country have our rightful rights. And uh, I have lived here in the state of Colorado and worked here, as has my oldest brother, John, the founder of the Native American Rights Fund in Boulder. And we have seen much progress in the state of Colorado for Native people. And I spent Indigenous People Day a week ago at what is called uh, Pikes Peak. But as one of the historical tribes of this state, uh, that's why I was invited to be part of Indigenous People's Day there, um, our tribe, my tribe's name for that mountain, and I do not speak my tribal language, but it roughly translates to 
where the earth meets the sky. And the Hickoria Apache, who are also indigenous to Colorado, um, they have, an, a, in their language, it's a very similar name. And so I would hope at some point with all of the name changing that's going on for uh, uh, particularly mountains and other things here in Colorado, that hopefully Pikes Peak can be renamed to uh, uh, better represent what it means to the native peoples who are still here. So I'm just blessed to be with you. And I just want to say, uh, uh, as I was listening to some of the previous remarks, I am a graduate of Leadership Denver, the class of 1986. And I, as part of that class, I was sitting in a room about this size with then Governor Romer speaking. And he stood up, and his opening phrase was something like, a hundred years ago, when civilization came to Colorado, and I went, and I, I grew up fairly shy, but I could not let that go by. I raised my hand, and I said, uh, Governor, I beg to differ with you, but civilization was here long before a hundred years ago. And later, he came up to me uh, at a reception for the Leadership Denver class, and he said, I'm so glad you called me up short about that. He said, I will never make that mistake again. And I don't believe he has. And I am so proud. I am so proud to be a resident of this state and seeing the progress in the last 41 years that I've lived here. You know, and, and as a person who works in Indian child welfare matters, I was very pleased, Madam Senator, uh, at the leadership in the Colorado legislature that when the Brackeen case was before the US Supreme Court and most of us very much feared that it would be struck down as unconstitutional. The state of Colorado, uh, and it was a late bill, codified the entirety of the Indian Child Welfare Act plus its regulations into Colorado law. And that's just a small bit of the good news in Colorado. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ms. Echo Hawk. Our last presenter is Tom Gonzalez, who is the Public Health Director for Larimer County Department of Health and Environment. He is a graduate of Colorado State University and University of Northern Colorado. He served as Deputy Public Health Director at El Paso County Public Health. He has had previous engagements with the Clark County Public Health in Washington, and he currently serves as the chair for the Larimer Regional Opioid Council. We're pleased to present Tom Gonzalez. Thank you, thank you very much. Boy, I, it's hard to go behind and beyond these three wonderful individuals, but I will try to do that. Uh, our mission at Larimer County Department of Health and Environment is working to provide everyone the opportunity for a healthy life. And in public health, we focus on entire populations rather than on the individual person. We ask why some populations are healthier than others. Public health is a science for protecting communities as a whole. And my role as a public health director is to ensure that all people are being provided resources equitably. And it's not happening in Larimer County. We've got to do better. Larimer County's north uh, here, uh, the main civic center is Fort Collins. It's the gateway to the Rocky Mountain National Park and home to the Colorado State Rams. Go Rams. You know, health equity isn't about providing everyone the same service or resource. It's about ensuring that people have the right resources to meet their needs and systematically assessing disparities in opportunities. As we heard from the senator, not everyone has the same opportunity, and that's what we're striving for. Achieving health equity requires first acknowledging health inequ inequ 
inequities exist and includes actively engaging communities in decision-making processes, incorporating equity, including uh, collecting and using data to drive our decisions. Public health agencies in Colorado are required to conduct a community health assessment every five years, and Larimer County recently finished this assessment, and we com combined both qualitative and quantitative data. But most importantly, we incorporated community voice from those that usually do not have a voice to determine the most pressing needs of the most vulnerable populations in our community, and we learned a lot. Over the past 100 years, public health has evolved from focusing on sanitation, such as clean water and food, and vaccinations, which are both very, very important, on working to, on addressing chronic disease and other emerging issues such as HIV AIDS, and now focusing on the social determinants of health. This means that we strategize and convene the community around the social and even political factors that can have a significant impact on health throughout the lifespan. Addressing these social determinants of health requires steadfast dedication, a well-funded and sustainable public health system, which is not in this country, a thriving public health workforce, strong partnerships across multiple sectors, and a commitment to advancing health equity and addressing the root causes of oppression, racism, bigotry, and poor health outcomes. Today's public health workers must advocate for policy changes that dismantle the discriminatory system and practices that can impact health outcomes. The COVID pandemic shined a bright light on our existing health inequities we had already known and documented. The recovery provides the opportunity to address these inequities in a fundamental way. Solving today's public health challenges are more and more complex. We are learning how those social determinants of health intersect and have such a strong impact on health and well-being and how those intersect to create barriers to living that optimal life for everyone. These determinants include food security, income and employment, mental health, transportation, housing, child care and education, the social environment and our communities, our tribes, climate change and the environment. For example, food insecurity, not having enough food to eat or being food insecure not, doesn't only mean poor nutrition, but also difficulty learning in school and missed opportunities later in life. In fact, in Larimer County, unfortunately, one out of eight children go to bed hungry. And I'm sure it's similar or worse in many other communities. Our social environment and lack of community, which can lead to social isolation, has a profound negative impact on life. In fact, the U.S. Surgeon General has declared loneliness as an epidemic in the United States. Our nation's doctor has stated that being alone and, dis dis and disconnected is equivalent to smoking 15 cigarettes a day. Layer that with our structural inequities and injustice, some communities are even more disadvantaged and impacted, including our BIPOC, LGBTQIA, and people with disabilities. Climate change and environmental health, where we put where we, uh, people live, work, and play, also has a profound impact on one's health, including access to just basic needs, clean water, clean air, safe and nutritious foods, and the built environment. And climate change is complicating this by increase in high heat days, intense storms such as floods and fires, putting more stress on our communities, especially neighborhoods and communities without easy access to the resources they need. Today's complex public health challenge require public health professionals to work on solutions by creating stronger connections with all our community members, elevating everyone's voice and sharing power, and sometimes giving up the power. Civic and community leaders and focusing on proactive solutions, bringing better solutions to the underserved communities. We need to be bridge builders among diverse stakeholders while considering equity through systematically assessing disparities in opportunities. Again, assessing those disparities in opportunities. In other words, we all need to be health strategists, where we bring access to critical data, serve as advocates, helping people to stay healthy, and creating more and vibrant, resilient communities together with that ultimate goal that we together build a vibrant, resilient community. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Gonzalez, and thank you to our panel for 
opening a variety of topics for us to dive into. Before everyone came into the room, we talked a little bit about Fulbright. And we're, I was asked, what topics do we stay away from? And I said, this is Fulbright. We don't stay away from anything. <laughs> we're open to everything because your lived experience is your truth, and that is the truth. I want to start this session off, or this part of the session off, by asking just a couple of questions of the panel. And my first question to each of you, as Fulbrighters, we are doers. We're not just thinkers, researchers, teachers. We are doers. We are also doers that have tentacles into our communities, in our profession, in our countries, in our host countries. Lots of tentacles are in this room. How would you like to see Fulbrighters lend their individual agency to the topics that you're most passionate and concerned about? And this is to no particular order. I think I'll jump off uh, and start off this conversation. It's an excellent question because uh, I think as uh, Mr. Gonzalez was, was sharing previously, um, there, we are living in a moment where not only are we more isolated socially, we're also more divided in so many different ways. And so I, I see in my, in my policy work at the Capitol now um, folks who are doing very similar veins of work in silos, folks who are who do extraordinary community work, but say I don't I don't get involved in policy, folks who uh, say I care deeply about policy, but I don't do that community thing, and those silos um, sort of reify themselves and. Um, and we, and we stay divided. Um, and so because you all are connectors, because you all um, are bridge builders, and because you have that, um, I don't know what the right term is, but that ability to um, seek and build uh, and strengthen and repair connections. I want to lift that up as being particularly important right now, given all of the different harms that we are seeing in this world. I think that, um, I don't know about y'all, but in my family, um, we have some folks who we just, we cannot talk about certain things anymore. And it is being able to open the door or maybe reopen the door or leave the door open and not keep it shut. And whether that's on an individual conversation or whether that's structural in nature, that is where I would ask for each of you to lend that expertise. Thank you. I would say from a public health perspective is every one of you in this room have extraordinary knowledge, worldly knowledge, and uh, often we're in our communities, within the communities, really wanting to learn from them. And to go in and say, hey, I'm the government, I'm here to help, it doesn't really work. We all heard that, right? Uh, so we're really wanting to work with the community on what we call community health uh, providers or community health initiators, which is all of you, and they're volunteers, and they come in a community, we try to compensate them by stipends and so forth for their, their great work, but bringing communities together right around social isolation. How can a community that maybe is isolated and divided, what can we bring in resources so we can create more social connections? And that's within the community. I, for me and my staff to come in and say we, we have the ideas is ridiculous and quite frankly, uh, slap in the face. Uh, we want to hear from the community. So I think all of you within your communities bear this knowledge uh, that we could utilize as well within communities to really hear their voice and then try to look at where those inequities are and give the resources so that then we can get these connections. I, I would be one of my thoughts. Thank you. Is 
Is it on? It is, all right. I love the term connector. Um, that's what I do in, in the Native community here in Colorado. Uh, how many of you in your Fulbright work have connected with indigenous communities where you've done your work? Wonderful. And I, I assume you've been doing connecting work because uh, I, I've had the, the privilege of visiting, I think, 22 or 23 countries around the world. And uh, in each case, I tried to do that because it, I think it not only makes me a better indigenous person, but it makes me a better American to connect people who don't necessarily always feel connected. And it can be done in various, various ways. I was reminded uh, sitting here that in 2004, uh, I went to Mongolia with the honorary consul here in Colorado, uh, Jim Wagenlander, who recruited me to Leadership Denver. And uh, they were going for a business conference. And I said, Neh. I said, I'll go, because you had to go at your own expense. I said, I'll go if you connect me with the governmental entity or whatever it is that deals with the children and the families of Mongolia. And it turned out it was World Vision that was doing that. But it was absolutely amazing because even though that's a religious nonprofit NGO, uh, they don't put religion first. They put service and connections first. And it was an amazing education. Uh, we even went to the Gobi and it was just uh, um, an amazing experience. So uh, I just challenge us all to do even more than we're currently doing in making those connections and raising people up in the process. Um, yeah, come on. Um, so as you were asking the question, my first thought went to this notion of praxis, right, which comes from bell hooks. Um, and it's this, the interconnectedness, the necessity of uh, uh, reflection and action, right? That they have to work um, almost seamlessly together. Action without reflection um, may be a bit foolish. Uh, reflection without action is, doesn't do much in the world, right? There's no hands and feet involved. Um, and so that's where my, my thinking went first. Um, and yet, I do think from a DEI educational perspective, um, we are witnessing a, a large backlash against DEI. Um, and, and people talk about like, well, there's the anti-DEI and there's all the anti-trans bills going on, right? So far this year, we have 568 um, different pieces of legislation that are anti-trans. And that's a really um, uh, oversimplistic way to talk about it because I think when we talk about kind of these anti um, uh, ideologies, we forget the people behind them, right? The people that are being harmed, the people that are being marginalized, the people who have been kicked out of homes, the people who don't have somewhere to go. Um, and and I think being a doer for me, right, I am, um, most of my work is on the practitioner level, um, means sitting in those spaces with people who have been harmed and are experiencing harm and trying to find repair, even if that is um, simply about um, repairing them to their own bodies, right? How do we restore their own, um, the reminders of their own human dignity that they were just born with but has been attempted to be stripped from them? And so as I think about the work we do, whether it's policy or practice or education or curricular, kind of whatever those big words are, um, it's not to forget the people that embody those spaces and how we do the work of repair with them. Um, I think that's where I'm at these days is um, I can do a lot of that high level work, um, but it's the person who shows up at my door that's like, I've had the worst day possible. Can you give me five minutes? And it's like, yes. And maybe that's the best five minutes they're gonna have for two weeks. And so I think with all the amazing talents um, and things of y'all in this room, it's to be reminded that like, give the five minutes to the person. Um, let that be an action and a moment of reflection in and of itself. Thank you all so much. And I, I know my fellow Fulbrighters will 
take heed to what you have said and not only com contemplate, but do. I've got another question, and if, if you would take a shot at this, could you tell us what you believe in your particular areas is the next frontier? What is it we are not thinking about that is either around the corner or in front of us but we don't see? that we can be proactive doers about. What's next? So I'll, I'll go down that road for a little bit. Um, I was just asked, uh, and there's a lot of assumption in, in the way I was asked the question, but the question was, next November, your job will no longer exist, right? What are you gonna do? Um, I've spent my entire career in higher education in DEI pretty much since I left higher education myself. And the assumption in that question is if we have a Republican candidate who takes office, um, the, the full deconstruction of DEI as, a, um, as an ideology will take place. Um, and it's a great question. It's maybe got a lot of things to it. Um, but what is behind it is the, I do think that we are entering into what, what might be called a reclamation space, a space of reclaiming out of fear, um, out of concern, out of scarcity, um, out of precarity. And so the question at hand is, so then how do we keep doing the real human work when we're not allowed to say the words, right? We can't don't say gay bill in, in Florida. Um, we can't do certain things with regards to our trans population, um, the deconstruction of affirmative action in college admissions. So there's a lot of this kind of, we're gonna just take the language away. But the language doesn't remove the truth of the human experience. The language won't end racism. Getting rid of the language won't end homophobia. Getting rid of the language won't end, end xenophobia or Islamophobia. And so how do we continue the work uh, in, in a, because those experiences are gonna exist, how do we continue the work being reminded that our language actually both frees us and binds us, right? It keeps us actually pretty shallow in some spaces. Um, and so I think what's coming is we have to reimagine and recast what is the work of inclusion with the goal being human dignity. Um, because all of the isms aren't gonna disappear but there may be legislation that says, but you can't do the thing. You can't do the implicit bias training. You can't do the thing. Um, and so I think what's coming is a, a need to reimagine our work um, under potentially a different flag that kind of recasts what we do, but keeps at the core of it the restoration and the repair of human dignity. You know, for the first time in 100 years in our country, life expectancy declined. You know, part of that could be directly related to the virus SARS-CoV-2, but it's more than that. And a country with much wealth we have still underscores many other countries. Why? I think we've got to say that what's around the corner is really embracing the social determinants of health and making health not a business. Health needs to be a shared value that we all agree upon, that we all say, wow, we, there's enough food in this country to feed everyone, it's just imbalanced, it's not, so we gotta take care of that. We've got to make sure that everybody has those opportunities and access to opportunities first. We gotta look at education, why are some have the opportunity others. If we don't, life expectancy is gonna to continue to decline. In the great United States of America, it should be going up. Why aren't we all living to be 100? It's like blue zones, let's look at that. So I, I think it's really stepping back and saying, what are, our, what are our values as Americans? What are we really gonna value? And I think we all share health, family's health, our community's health, and I think that's where we need to go back to and really investigate what 
is those values and, and move those forward. And I think the life expectancy and that shared health value will increase. I'm, I, I will confess that I am struggling a bit with the question because, um, and I was just sharing uh, uh, with my colleagues here earlier, right before we began the panel, two weekends ago I went to um, the, an African American History Museum in Philadelphia where they invited 20 artists to reflect upon this question, is the sun setting or is the sun rising on American democracy? The year before the pandemic, my first year in office, I carried a bill that was like, I, I thought it was like rather straightforward. We have, uh, it turns out Colorado has, or had at the time, um, the lowest kindergarten um, childhood immunization rate in the country. Um, we had our crunchy hippies and our religious fundamentalists kind of um, combining in order to um, really opt out in a significant way here in our state. And so I worked um, uh, on a bill, again, prior to COVID, uh, to, um, boost our uh, to boost our childhood immunization rates. I was stunned the extent of the pushback that I received. The bill that we ultimately passed asks people, in order to opt out, please watch like a 15 minute video. That's it. The pushback was incredible. I serve on the um, State Veterans and Military Affairs Committee in the Senate. We um, uh, ensure that our elections are safe and secure. Colorado has one of the, uh, the I would argue, the gold standard um, election system. We mail out vote ballots to every single voter uh, in the state of Colorado. Um, we have same day uh, voter registration, incredible opportunities um, to participate, and yet the racial um, uh, voting gap is significant, 10 points in some communities, greater in others. And we still have work to do. And when a third of the country actively is engaging in mis- or disinformation about, um, uh, I don't know, who won the presidency, it really begs the question, is the sun rising or setting? And how do we, how do we start to engage and say, there is a truth. There is, I don't know, verifiable facts about things like who won the presidential election, for instance. But those fissures are starting to tear, apart, tear us apart at the seams. I don't know when we're gonna get a new speaker. Y'all's guess is as good as mine. And so um, are we going to, I, to me it's like the next frontier is are we going to teeter on that edge? and reimagine what something, uh, and, and then step back from that and say, you know what, let's actually go back to supporting the rule of law. Let's actually go back to um, our institutional norms, our democratic institutional norms. Or are we going to imagine something different? I think there are a lot of different ideas in this country right now um, about what that should entail. And as we look to, and I, 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 I venture to say that you all, in your experiences in other nations across the world, um, have a lot of perspectives to share about that. But I don't think that we can um, say, everything's cool, don't worry, we got this. Um, in, in our own politics, right here, right now, just ask your neighbor about what they think about um, putting up affordable housing in your neighborhood. <laughs> Ask your neighbor about what they think about, do you want your tax um, refund back or should we invest that in schools? Just ask your neighbor about what they think about issue A, B, C, right? 
Um, and if we are not able to have those conversations with our neighbor, with the car ahead of us, um, uh, as we're dropping our kids off at school, um, with the person behind us at the line uh, for coffee, that's, that's part of what I um, am, am worried about. I too struggled with that question um, because I think we've got much to do with what we currently have on our plate. And, um, you know, we don't really even have a democracy in this country. We have a Republican form of government. And I think we really need to do a lot of soul searching and, and uh, walk in our talk to really be who we say we want to be. And so maybe that is the new frontier. Thank you for indulging me and entertaining those questions. At this point, we want to open questions for the audience. And I hope that there is someone with the microphone, Munir, that will allow you to articulate your questions in such a way that we can all hear them. Okay. Hi, everyone. My name is Matthew Hawley. I'm the founder of Conversations by Courage. Essentially, I do what you guys have been doing, connecting ideas, sectors, and communities for collective well-being. I really enjoyed this talk, but it, it prompts a question for me. So much what I've seen in this conference so far is civil society groups trying to control the narrative, or maybe sort of get ahead of the narrative that seems to be in front of us, that no longer in the 21st century with the rise of digital technology and digital communication, our governments, religious leaders, uh, universities are important authority figures where the public goes to for information. And I think that it is a big impediment to civic discourse because without that, you don't have civility. So my question for you all is, how are you as groups innovating to be able to engage in information war that quite frankly, have not seen well government, academic institutions, foundation, et cetera, do really well to be able to engage the public at a time where the most important authority figure, it seems, are each other rather than the traditional authority figures who often look toward. I'm gonna grapple with that question and I don't know that I will answer it completely. But I will say um, that uh, when I first came into the legislature, I was elected as part of the blue wave in 2018. Um, I was like, man, if I, I worked at an immigration and criminal defense law firm previous to this, and seeing the devastation um, to immigrant families in the state of Colorado that the Trump administration wrought, it was like, well, I never thought I would run for office, um, but, um, thought I would push somebody to the left and then, you know, he would win and then I'd go back to doing my organizing and activist work. Whoops. Um, so um, so I, I get elected and at the, um, uh, all of the floor debate proceedings are televised. You can stream them online, you can watch them. And the impact of that, one would argue that that is um, transparency, that that is good, that that is um, uh, accountable, right? But what it actually ends up doing is, um, in a weird way, and I learned this the hard way, is it ended up stifling floor debate. Folks didn't want to say the wrong thing, and so they said very little things. They, we'd splice 30-second videos, We'd say some quippy thing at the well that you could then splice and put on Twitter or put on your Facebook page and be like, look at me fighting this fight. <laughs> Follow me at Senadora Julie on all the socials. And, and that ended up, I would, I would go to the well, have debate, ask a question, and then my, my colleagues on the other side of the aisle, my Republican colleagues, instead of going to the well and responding, they'd pull me off to the side and say, well, what is this bill really about? There is, um, uh, there is, I think, actually value in individual relationships, 
But there's also, I think, um, difficulty um, to have those conversations um, in a um, in such a fraught um, moment politically, which is why I think I come back again to it is incumbent upon all of us, whether that's within the, the policy sphere, whether that is in, um, in our families, in our communities, um, in uh, our workplaces, the importance of being able to pull people together and have difficult conversations. Because sometimes folks are, I, I, am, I am living in a, in, a, in a political moment where folks are afraid to even ask questions for the fear of, the fact that you don't know being weaponized against you, if that makes sense. Um, so education in particular, I'll speak just to higher education in this nation, um, has never been a good arbiter of information. Like holistic, full, robust, diverse, information, right? We have our canonical things, right? You're gonna read these bits of philosophy, these bits of uh, economics, these bits of English, these, right? And we're gonna say that that's Western Civ. If you, I, I'm probably dating myself, I took Western Civ when I was in college. Um, they don't really call it that anymore. Um, but we have schools, right, and, and state governments that are banning African American history, or LGBTQ history, or Native history, right? And so um, education actually has burned itself, right? Um, because of how we've constructed education over time. What does it mean to be an educated person? It means that you know these books, and you know this language, and you know these texts, and then you've got your feather in your cap, or whatever, right? So um, it makes, higher education a complex space, especially in the spaces where we're saying, actually, we're trying to engage in um, ethnic studies, right? DU has a critical race and ethnic studies major and minor, and, um, and that was up for debate for a long time with regard to, like, is that appropriate? Well, yes, because you don't talk about these things in your other history classes or in your law classes or pre-law or whatever. So um, education is in a weird spot because it's, it has historically said this is information rather than saying this is information and we have to grapple with the elasticity and the tensions inherent in this space to be able to actually be critical people of thought. Right, to be able to look at an issue that is happening in the nation or in the world and say, I have a gut response to what's happening out of my socializations, out of the things I learned when I was little, out of whatever, and I, I'm okay saying it is so much more complex than I know. And so now I gotta go figure those things out, right? I need to go dig around. That's, that's what liberal education is meant to do, is to say, We've given you kind of uh, a smattering of things, but among that, what we've attempted to do is teach you how to think critically and be a learner and a finder of the truth. Um, but we've also done that language or that defining in a bounded system that's pretty white, pretty heterosexual, right, all the things. and so. Um, I actually think that education is in this really ripe place to reimagine itself and the context in which it could become a revolutionary space. Whether it takes that up or not is, up, you know, we'll see. And whether or not governments and, um, and other bodies of people allow for that to happen. But it makes sense to me that, like, we become our, we become our voices of truth because that lived experience I'm not hearing about in school. And so all of a sudden, I find a piece of information off of a colleague, and I'm like, oh, I need to go dig and find that thing. And it's not in a library or whatnot. So there's something, I think, that you know, is inherently problematic in our education systems because we're not as good at teaching the critical learning thing, and we say the, way, the, the things we've given you to critically analyze 
is pretty small in context, but we act as if it's all of it, if that makes sense. Thank you. Do we have more questions? Hello. I just, I, should I talk? Oh, hello. Thank you for your comments. Um, I'm Kathy Findare from Durango, Colorado. And, and I just want to follow up something that Dr. Dial mentioned, and that was mentioned in the previous plenary, which is the, just a few blocks from here, History Colorado used to be the Colorado Historical Society, has two extraordinary exhibits featuring Native American voices. And if you have a chance, it's closed now. It opens tomorrow at 10 AM. One is on the Ute peoples of Colorado and Utah with their voices, and the other is on the Sand Creek Massacre. Uh, this was set up. This is a very recent exhibit with the voices, first-person voices of the Arapaho and Cheyenne peoples. And also tomorrow at 10 o'clock, those who walk um, in the descendants of Sand Creek Massacre victims, their allies and others have walked 173 miles from the Sand Creek Massacre site following what the soldiers, the route the soldiers took coming back to Denver. They're gonna be in front of the Capitol building at 10 o'clock tomorrow morning returning their walk. I just wanted to announce that just so those of you who are gonna be here um, to, to take advantage of those opportunities. Thank you very much. Can we take one more question? Haley, I believe you had a question. Hi folks, Keegan Julius. Um, I was and am thrilled to hear from this panel, especially because I'm visiting from St. Petersburg, Florida, where we, the League of Women Voters and a couple of key organizations championed declaring racism a public health crisis. Um, we saw that the social determinants of health were having a critical impact on our citizens. Um, our black residents were exceeding the rates of premature deaths of, for of white and Hispanic residents in every single category except for lung cancer. Um, so in the spirit of us being a room full of doers, of people who have the agency to enact socio-political change, is there a particular policy initiative that is near and dear to your hearts that you feel would be critical and impactful that we all should be championing? Give, give us one, any one of you, give us one. I, I would, that's a wonderful question. I would say, I'm gonna give a shout out to Pooter School District, uh, the school district of much of Fort Collins, Wellington. Uh, they have put in inclusivity and in inclusion as a centerpiece of their policy in education. And we have a youth group at the uh, Larimer County Health Department. I'm very proud of our youth group. And we now have a safe space, a third space for our youth. That's what our youth one is called, TAC 212. Uh, and it's substance free. It's, it's got mental health resources. It's got professional resources for writing resumes or applying for schools. That's a start, that's a pilot. Where we're, we're looking at the youth, we're seeing where there are issues within our youth. I've got two high schoolers, so it's near and dear to me. But if we can continue to make inclusivity and pull out this bigotry, remove it, and start ingraining it in our, our schools and make these safe places for all of our youth, I think that's, I, I see that as a bright future and I'm excited. And we're gonna wanna, that's the one pilot we wanna get them all throughout our community. So thank you for the question. Policy? Don't threaten me with a good time. Uh, so I, I think that in this moment, one of the things that we are grappling with as a society is should we continue to let people um, uh, build their own lives, make their own decisions about who they are going to be, where they want to live, who they want to love, whether and how they, and, and when, um, they want to start a family, right, um, or not. 
Those are, those are fundamental questions that are getting um, debated about um, uh, in our politic, right? Like, um, so issues of identity, issues of migration, issues of um, uh, all sorts of identity. Um, and uh, by way of dis or misinformation, we are, there are folks who want to engage and, or who could engage and who instead check out. And so one of the things that I've become really interested in, it's a bill that I'm gonna be working on this upcoming year, um, is uh, to ensure that even more people, folks who are on the margins, have access to the ballot. Um, not that like, oh, if you vote so-and-so in or so-and-so out, or if you vote for that bill or the thing, all of the things will be solved. But it is one piece that we ask of you to like, hey, weigh in because that voice and that vote does matter. Um, uh, in Colorado, uh, f only felons during the point of confinement. So if you're on parole, you can actually register to vote. But if you are confined, um, you cannot. There's a whole bunch of folks who are confined pre-trial, mm -hmm. right, in our jails, who um, uh, you are innocent until proven guilty, but if you ain't got the money in order to pay your bail, you sit in our jail system and election day comes, we're gonna have one in about three weeks um, here. And Denver actually does this incredible and extraordinary act they send county clerks, election workers, to the jail to make sure that folks who are eligible have the ability to cast their ballots. <laughs> Love Denver. We're gonna make that happen across every single jail in the state, right? That's the work ahead. Um, because one may think, oh well, if they have committed harm to society, they shouldn't have a say. Not if they're sitting in jail pre-trial. Not if they're convicted of a misdemeanor. They have that franchisement, right? And so we should ensure that every single person who can should be able to exercise that. Got a whole bunch of other work to do to make sure that everybody else engages, right? But like, let us continue the work of expanding opportunity. That's just one of like the <laughs> many things that I'm really excited to work on. But, um, but I love the question, and I would encourage each of you to think about whether it's in your school board, whether it's at your city council, whether it's at um, your local re registered neighborhood organization, whether it's the international, uh, the international um, politic that you um, engage in, right? There's a lot of it happening right now, right? But figure out what that thing is and be passionate and engage other folks to it because that is the work. That is the work of of engagement um, in order to make democracy continue to function, right? I've been all doom and gloom here, but there is incredible bright, there are incredible bright spots happening as well that I wanna make sure that we continue to lift up. I'll just say something. I work in pol like some of the policy at DU. I have a lot of thoughts about local state policies that I'll keep to myself simply because I'm not as knowledgeable as I should be in some of them. Um, but I ask myself, so DEI, J, justice, people are starting to pull in the J, or they talk about being a Jedi. Um, I would make a horrible Jedi, because uh, I'm a klutz and I worry about what that would mean, but um, we really like the diversity, right? We like this notion of like, look, we got a lot of people who look different, or they got a lot of different experience. We like the inclusion, because it's all the feels, right? Like I can. I can feel good about us all being in this space. We don't ask the equity and the justice question enough when we're writing policy. Um, we don't ask the, what is the outcome of the thing we are doing? We really like giving access, but what is the outcome? What, when we're putting something on the table, how are we thinking down the road to say, what are the potential unintended consequences of the thing? And are we thinking about the equitable ends? And then the second one we don't think about is justice. We don't think about what do we need to dismantle to make this thing happen, to allow for this thing to happen, to allow a group of people to have franchisement or whatever that is. And so um, um, my colleagues and I work really hard in any conversation that those are the two front questions. What is the outcome? 
How do we get to that equitable outcome? And what are we dismantling? Because we can tack a whole bunch of things on higher education that look fancy, but if the core is still rotten, then the core is rotten. So how are we deconstructing and taking apart what is at the center that pushes people to the margins? Um, so when I look at policies or anything like that, those are the two things that are always in front of me. Thank you. We have unfortunately come to the end of our time together, but I would like for us to give one more round of applause to this wonderful panel. <laughs>